to give a long introduction to your paper. I'm not going to give an introduction at all. I'm going to assume members have read it. Uh, that's a wild assumption. <laughs> okay, Mr. Bowden. Well, maybe, you know, just for the benefit of those of us who've not read it, uh, you know, I have, of course. Um, but just for, you know, the, the few people who have not read it, um, you could give a very, very, very short introduction or a summary of, let's say, two, three minutes. Uh, some of the main uh, conclusions, uh, you know, some of the topics are well known to some of us, but not to all. And then we'll open the floor to uh, questions and debate. Well, with permission, I've decided not to take that approach. Uh, I did give as many of these issues in February. Uh, this report is designed to be self-contained and as concise as possible. So well, the approach I tend to take is more forensic. What I'd like to do is actually go through the text, calling attention to particular issues that I think the committee might wish to pay further attention to, just in case, as it were, when they reflect and read this at leisure, uh, those points go by. There are some quite significant points buried within, and I think that might actually be more productive. Of course, some, will, some things will get lost in that approach, but I think that will actually be more efficient use of time than simply trying to restate and recompress what is already there. Okay, that's fine. Well, you know, the floor is yours and you decide how, how you do it. Um, we have about 15 minutes and then we do question and answer. Well, first of all, I'd like to say how grateful I am to the Parliament for the opportunity and the Commission to prepare this report. Uh, the scope of this report is solely on the activities of the United States and the National Security Agency. There is obviously linkage between the activities of the United States and the National Security Agency and uh, one particular member state, but I haven't explored that in this report. Uh, just a few other preliminary remarks. Uh, I know that I'm billed always as the former Chief Privacy Advisor of Microsoft just to dispel any possible uh, uh, misconception that there is really no alignment between my views and that of Microsoft, if anyone was under, under that impression. Um, so, um, excuse me, the, um, I think that the first observation I'd like to make goes actually as a more general observation to something that Mr. Bronze said earlier, that uh, perhaps there is a view that it's the uh, collection of data is less important than the use. And I think I disagree with that. And the reason I disagree with that, I want to illustrate in this way. Since the Snowden revelations, public opinion now understands that persons of influence in society, politicians, journalists, people in any organizational hierarchy, know that the National Security Agency is likely to know any personal secret which they have committed to an electronic medium perhaps over the past 10 years. We don't know how long this data is stored. So to jump in at the deep end, I think this creates profoundly dangerous destabilizing factors in democracy because it means that public opinion now has to consider are the people of influence in society, as it were, looking over their shoulder, thinking, second guessing, oh, maybe I'd better not write that letter. Maybe I'd better soften my approach. Maybe I'd better not do something which is against the interests of US foreign policy. Because if those secrets, those embarrassments, those points of leverage on persons of influence in society, even if they don't exist, if the public believes they might exist, this is something, a transition, if you like, which has already happened. And I don't think this has been sufficiently factored in because of the scale of the Snowden event. We've never had a disclosure of secrets like the Snowden event. Another general prefatory remark is there are known to be still tens of thousands of documents in the Snowden material which have not been written about and have scarcely been analyzed. So it's entirely possible that uh, the subject matter which is written about in this report will be dwarfed, in fact, by subsequent revelations. The approach I've taken in preparing the report was to try and fuse together historical and contextual policy information to give, uh, to give some sense of perspective with the up-to-the-minute revelations that have been happening over the past two months and to weave those together. So on page eight, the first, uh, I think, theme I'd like to draw to the committee's attention is something very fundamental that's often overlooked. Uh, it's in the section marked privacy governance, and it's really to do with the way that data protection law works. If one takes a long perspective, then there's something rather odd about data protection law in that it takes away a sort of fundamental power, if you like, from the individual. 
Once data is submitted to somebody else's system, whether that's a government system or a private sector system, the individual can really no longer object when that data is copied. If that data is copied to a thousand machines within one organization, or if that data is copied onto a thousand different organizations or into another legal regime, it is an assumption that if the right legal boxes have been ticked, well, the individual just has to put up with that. But it's sort of obvious, and it's true, that every time data is copied from one system to another system, the privacy risk is increasing, strictly increasing. It never decreases, because the risk that something bad will happen to that data and that something bad will happen to the individual as a result of that happening to that data is always going to increase. Now, this is a long-held assumption in data protection law going back 40 years. But I think the Snowden events and the developments in cloud computing particularly we ought to be asking some rather fundamental questions about the intellectual basis for data protection law. Uh, moving through the report, uh, I'd next just like to dwell on the section on page 13 on X key score. Uh, X key score is, is, uh, is, a, is an indexing and searching system. Uh, it involves a three-day rolling buffer of the full take of data stored at 150 global sites on 700 database servers. And it indexes email addresses, file names, IP addresses, port numbers, cookies, webmail and chat usernames, buddy lists, phone numbers and metadata from web browsing sessions, and so forth. So that description is rather flat, but when one dwells on the immensity, the immense power, surveillance power of that capability, it's something that we've never really dreamt of before. It's something Orwell did not foresee. It means that data can literally be plucked out retrospectively in time. It gives the analyst a kind of time machine. So without any prior suspicion about an individual, it's possible to go back and examine the conduct and behavior of anybody in the world, uh, except, of course, Americans to a limited degree that we'll come on to. So the next point of interest, I think, is about Bull Run on page 14, which is the code name for the NSA program for the last decade, to, to break into widely used encryption systems, probably not directly by mathematical techniques, uh, but using things like side channel attacks, uh, electronic emanations from uh, the computer through which the key can be reconstructed, and also through uh, perhaps suborning or co-opting manufacturers of security systems and equipment. Now, this has created the most shock amongst the technical security community and everywhere in the world. Analysts and security specialists are now trying to guess and reconstruct which systems may be vulnerable and re-key or upgrade those systems. But they're working in the dark. And uh, from talking to some of the journalists who have had access to this material, I have not, um, we can't expect there to be very much more specific detail to come out about that. So we have an immediate problem, which is we know a large number of the systems that we thought three months ago were secure. We know a large number of those are not secure, but we don't know how to find out which ones. Uh, moving through, uh, the next point of interest, I think, is about uh, foreign intelligence information on page 18. Foreign intelligence information is the core term of art underlying the PRISM program. It was first defined in the 1978 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the part that I'm interested in here has not actually changed since 1978. To get the little uh, italicized text, you have to substitute two levels of definition in what is rather a complex formulation, and this, if you like, only represents one-tenth of the full definition of foreign intelligence information. But it is worth dwelling on, and I'll read it in full. It is information with respect to a foreign-based political organization or foreign territory that relates to, or if concerning a US person, is necessary to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. So that is an immensely broad definition. That really means that any data of assistance to US foreign policy is eligible, including expressly political surveillance over ordinary, lawful, democratic activities of citizens in European Union countries. Now, we don't know to what extent that definition is applied because a curious fact is there has been nothing written at all about that in 40 years. There has been no legal commentary. 
There has been no published guidance. There is no executive orders elaborating what that means. It is simply unknown what effect that has been put to over the past 40 years. But the supposition is that this would be the power under which uh, purely political surveillance of activities in a foreign country, counter espionage possibly, uh, but essentially political spying would be conducted. Now, there is in this definition, you will notice, a discrimination by nationality. If this was concerning a United States person, the criteria would be necessity, a very, very strict legal threshold. But if it's not a US person, it merely relates about the, legus, the weakest legal threshold one can imagine. And when we come on to look at the 702 power, that also contains an express discrimination by nationality. So when you apply the two together, there is what I call a double discrimination by nationality, favoring American citizens and disfavoring everybody else. Now, I don't think there is anything in European law remotely like that. In fact, from, I haven't included a human rights analysis in this work, but talking to human rights experts, they would regard that as simply and obviously unlawful under the European Convention. Um, there is, in fact, also, I'll just mention this briefly, in Section 215, uh, Greg Nogem was discussing uh, the U.S. trend to focus on trying to reform the Patriot Section 215 power. Well, the reforms that are being discussed in the U.S. actually are going to not help us very much, and they're certainly not going to help us if the part I've called attention to here remains intact, which is that apart from the counter-terrorist justification, there is also this very broad purpose to collect foreign intelligence information not concerning a U.S. person. So that is, if you like, a carte blanche to apply the 215 power to foreigners. So if they restricted the selective collection of information according to the counterterrorism criteria, but don't fix that, it won't do us any good. Uh, I want next to go on to page 21 and... When we uh, consider the collection of foreign intelligence information under the PRISM program, which is based on the Section 702 power, uh, there is the statute to work with, and the statute says that there are minimization and targeting procedures. And when I wrote my analysis of this power for the report last year in cloud computing when presented this to LIBA in February, I never expected to see those minimization and targeting procedures but indeed they were published unredacted in full by The Guardian on the 20th of June. So when one reads them, what one finds is that there is no limitation whatsoever or no protections whatsoever for non-US persons. It is, frankly, as I had expected and predicted. So this is a very strong confirmation that there are no uh, privacy protective powers or procedures in place for non-Americans. Uh, the next point on page 22 is to do with a disclosure that was made uh, just on August 21st, and it was actually a letter written uh, by, the by the U.S. government to the leaders of the Congressional Intelligence Committees, and it has a particular uh, paragraph, which I've quoted there in italics, which is of great significance, I think, to this work, uh, the work of this committee and has not been commented on elsewhere. Now, what is going on here is after the National Security Agency has filtered the information it collects from the upstream systems and all the other systems we talked about, they apply this uh, attempt to make a 50% probability determination, is this data about Americans? And the data which they think is probably on that 50% basis about foreigners then continues in a kind of pipeline. Now, what this paragraph says is that pipeline can be split. So, for example, the CIA would get its own primary copy of that filtered data to work with and store and analyze and use for its own missions and, indeed, other members of the U.S. intelligence community. So, if we consider what material Snowden would likely have had access to, it may well be he did not have access to the kind of compartmentalized uh, exploitation guidelines for that CIA mission, for example. But it's highly significant that, if you like, in the, the agencies of the intelligence community can have their own copies of this data and then essentially work with that without restriction because it has already been filtered for foreignness. Uh, the next point I'd like to go on to is page 23, uh, just about uh, the general position with our instruments in data protection which have tried over the years to prevent this, including safe harbor, BCRs for processes, uh, and of course now for cloud computing. 
Uh, and a general remark I would make, and of course it's central to the whole report, is there are loopholes. It appears to be the case that Commission officials in the past 10 years have knowingly or unknowingly permitted these loopholes in the text. The loopholes are typically involving the phrase national security. Does it mean the national security of member states or does it mean the national security of the United States? And also another phrase that crops up is a legally binding request. And a legally binding request in US terms includes the full breadth of that foreign intelligence information, including the political purposes we have studied. So I suggest it will be important to the work of this committee to try and go back to some of the papers of the Commission from 10 or more years ago to actually analyze who made those decisions. Was it in good faith? Was there, as it were, bungling? Was there ineptitude? Was there complicity? And I think we should delve into that. Uh, I have said a little bit more, uh, perhaps with uh, less restraint than elsewhere in the report on the bottom, page 24. Uh, and if we go on now, please, to some of the recommendations. Uh, in making these recommendations, I'm conscious of the uh, Committee of Works have expressed an interest in reinstating Article 42 in particular. Uh, but before we get there, I have suggested the idea that things being now as we understand them, uh, European Union citizens are placing their data in jeopardy by using American web services and websites. There is already in the directive 9546 a requirement where the basis of processing is consent for that to be informed consent, informed of all relevant risks. So there is already a power uh, in existence to say that European Union citizens should be informed of the fact that if they use an American web service, their data is going to be subject to political surveillance by the United States. And I believe it would be salutary uh, for a strategic approach for this to be done. It would then make sure that European Union citizens were warned that if any material of political interest in the United States is in, contained in what they, uh, what they are doing, perhaps they better think twice. But of course, it's also designed to have a political effect on, I think, raising awareness and perhaps political solidarity within the European Union. It goes without saying from the rest of the analysis in the report that uh, the main mechanisms we have for export of data are not protective against FISA or Patriot. And so in particular, I don't see any case for allowing transfers under model contracts or safe harbor to continue. Uh, of course, disengaging, disengaging those will be a very, very serious matter and will have to be done in a phased way and in a strategic way. Uh, and also, to couple a strategic approach, it, it's going to be necessary and I think beneficial if we consider how to develop our own serious industrial policy for cloud computing, uh, a so-called European cloud. In dealing with that, when we get the further report on the activities of SIGINT within the European Union, of course, some member states are going to be in a problematic position. I'll say no more than that. So if we go on to consider the factors about Article 42, uh, there are some reservations which I would think we, we should consider on page 28. Um, the CEO of Yahoo recently said that if they had said more about the coercion that they were subject to in respect of 702, uh, she could have gone to jail for espionage charges for in fact up to 10 years uh, on the most obvious charge and perhaps, uh, depending on interpretation, uh, a penalty of up to 30 years or the death penalty. I'm not suggesting that's likely. I'm just suggesting that's what's in, in the US law. So against that uh, penalization, we are going to create a conflict of law with Article 42 where the penalty on the European side would be 2% uh, fine. Now, from my experience working in Microsoft, that, that is simply not going to work. So my proposal is that we should recognize that if a company fails to comply with the reinstated Article 42, we should make that a very serious criminal offense, at, at the least. And at the moment, the way the new regulation is structured, uh, there is really complete discretion for member states to, discover, to, to set the penalties for that kind of contravention. And I think it would be much better to be more explicit about making an explicit serious criminal offense in the new regulation. Also, the level of fines are going to be very, very inadequate. I've referred to a case which I think uh, I'm familiar with and a lot of other people will be, that Microsoft picked up a $1 billion fine in a competition case a few years ago to do with their monopoly over local area networking. 
However, the profits that Microsoft made over the decade which that uh, fine took to stick were probably around 20 billion, conservatively. In other words, a 20 to 1 mismatch between a cynical calculation of continuing with that business strategy and the fine they ultimately had to pay. Now, that's why I've recommended that to get a really effective uh, consideration of complying with the uh, reinstated Article 42, we probably need to think about raising the fine, at least in that respect of that offence, 10 times to something like 20%. I mean, that may sound extraordinary, but all one can say is some of these companies have such enormous resources and deep business strategies, in my personal experience, that is really have to be considered. Now, the last point I'll make before questions is to say that since we know about Bull Run, the NSA project to subvert cryptography, cryptographic protection, but we don't know which ones, the scope of Article 42 at the moment would only apply to controllers and processors, but not vendors of security systems or vendors of equipment. So the idea is we could make Article 42 apply to them also. So if they were coerced by the NSA to put in a back door, even if they're not processing personal data, they have got to tell the European regulator that they've had to put in a back door. So we are creating a further conflict of law and further jeopardy and penalties for those companies if they choose to comply with US law rather than European law. So I will leave it there for questions, and I hope those specific points have been helpful for the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um